Great. Well, I think we are live uh, and ready yes. to start. So um, welcome, Suresh, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Nick Hughes, and uh, it's a real privilege to join uh, your penultimate session uh, on the Festival of Ideas. And I'm equally pleased to be joined by uh, Suresh Sethi with me, who uh, Suresh and I are actually ex-colleagues. We both worked uh, for Vodafone nearly sort of 15 years ago now. Um, uh, and what we're going to do in this session is talk a little bit about um, digital innovation. We're, we're both from the digital payments world. Um, and for me, it's a world that's uh, suddenly emerged. It's a sector which didn't exist 20 years ago. Uh, and yet today, you know, we count more than 1.5 billion mobile wallets. We know literally billions of dollars move every day through these things, uh, through smartphones, you know, there are now 3.5 billion smartphones on the planet. And all of this has happened in the space of 10 to 12 years. And, um, and what we're going to talk about today is, well, what does that mean? Not just for financial services and digital financial services, but what, how, how does digital finance play into other sectors? And if we were to have an ability to jump forward another 15 years, what, you know, what would that landscape look like? And, um, you know, I, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm sort of super excited uh, ab about the power uh, of this tool. So uh, digital tools, you know, it comes with some ups and some downsides. But I, but I think we have a tool at our at our disposal today, which will help us address many development issues. Um, and so backwards and forwards over the next 30 to 40 minutes, uh, Suresh and I will share a few ideas and concepts. And please, can I encourage you to put some uh, questions into the chat and we'll try and find some space uh, for that as well. So Suresh, welcome. Um, well, thank you for thank agreeing. Thank you so much, Derek. Yeah, and uh, yeah, perhaps we could just start with a, a very quick reflection on the 15 years when you and I were busy trying to get M-Pesa, which is a mobile money platform, out and off its sort of knees and into growth phase. But I would love to hear your thoughts, uh, and especially in the, in the Indian context where, you know, India now is held up as a as a way to do things in the digital finance space. So yeah, um, Suresh, any, any, what are your key reflections on the last 10, 15 years? Yeah, I think Nick, the biggest thing which has changed uh, is that uh, from a point of uh, time when we were looking at introducing M-Pesa in India, I do remember those times when we had significant barriers to adoption. Uh, people's concern in adopting digital, people's concern in getting their, you know, the cash converted into a digital, uh, equivalent and getting transferred nobody would believe it will reach the other end so we've yes. come from a time when when we were actually trying to educate people how digital and technology can make lives easier and yes. after seeing the phenomenal success of mpesa as a business model in africa uh, it was something we still had to take a reasonable amount of time in convincing people explaining to them how how digital currency works and how money can move from point to point just like you do text messaging yeah. uh, to a time today when we actually see a phenomenal amount of adoption. I think over the last two years with the pandemic, uh, things have significantly changed. I think more driven out of necessity than otherwise, people have sharply <clears throat> uh, increased their adoption of digital and digital behavior, especially with challenges where you are looking at doing everything remotely. You don't want to have contact, how do you really enable an economy using digital? So I think mm -hmm. that has been a huge learning. And the other thing which I was reflecting when we were discussing earlier, uh, when we looked at the Kenya model and we wanted to bring M-Pesa to India, uh, we were immediately stuck by one significant difference between the two countries. Uh, in Kenya, for example, there was Vodacom, which was actually having a majority share of the market and yeah. you were looking at one player with a significant hold on the ecosystem, being able to successfully deliver financial inclusion, deliver payments on that platform. Yeah. Uh, as we switch to India, we realized actually it's a fragmented market. Mm. And how do you play in a market where you are where you have limited interoperability? So if you are telling somebody to use M-Pesa, there was limited ability to move money from M-Pesa to say Airtel money. Yeah. And that is something I think India has done very well after that in terms of introducing open technologies open platforms and standards which have yeah. made interoperability as possibility yeah so as we look at 
the new paradigm of uh, business and technology, I think it is totally embedded in open architecture, open standards and open paradigms. And that yeah. has been a significant reason for the success of adoption and usage as we see it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And, and I often look back at those early days in Kenya where you're right. Uh, the network operator, Vodafone and Safaricom, had a 62% market share. And that just gave them the ability to drive very fast with a consumer proposition. And, you know, the, the market share actually rose on the back of M-Pesa to around 90%. But then in other markets, it you know it didn't it hasn't worked like that and um and and so for me the, one of the takeaways was you need a, a proof point and a proof case to show what the product can do for people's livelihoods and and that's really what why Mpesa stands out so much from in my mind in Kenya because it just showed actually we can really solve some of these financial inclusion challenges using digital technology but you can't quite lift that model take it to other places and, and drop it in. And, and, and your point's exactly right. You need, that's where you start hitting more friction points around interoperability and market share and pricing controls. And, you know, and I'm, 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 I, I think, you know, we are, we are, we've have, we've gone through that. If you think about this as, you know, mo mobile money or digital funds, it's almost like a teenager now. It's, it's actually yeah. pretty big, but it's still trying to figure out, you know, what's the way forward. And, and those early infant days in Africa showed us what we could do, but now we need to think about framework conditions. And and on that, I, I mean, the India stack keeps coming out uh, as a model that the other markets should follow. And, and you know, perhaps you could talk a little bit about the India stack. I mean, I'm on the board of Bcash, uh, and in Bcash, you know, with 55 million registered account holders now. But we we can see um, those challenges you've mentioned. How do you make it work across all networks? How do you make it work for all consumers? And I think you do need some frameworks in place, some consistent legislation, et cetera. And so yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on why the India stack has worked so well. And what does it mean if we were to sort of jump forward 10 years? What, 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 what do you see next, uh, assuming you've got that framework in place now? So I think that's a, that's a definitely a use case on which we can build. And, and you're absolutely right. It's the frameworks and the basic principles on which India stack was built. So I think primarily, if you look at it again, it is an ecosystem which was built on the principles of first providing an identity to everybody. So what we a lot of times call as the trust layer, I yeah. can prove who I am. If I yeah. do that, my ability to identify myself and have an identity which is digital, digitally verifiable. Yeah. So that became a very important component or the, or the building block on which the entire construct of the India stack got built. Yeah. I think the biggest challenge was giving a billion Indians an identity which can be digitally verified. And, and that, yeah. that started the whole, uh, whole uh, inclusion uh, exactly. journey, if you may. And post that, I think important equally is, as you said, there have to be use cases on which you start building the story. One is about opening accounts. And that was that was a, naturally the first step uh, which the government took. And there was an amazing convergence of government policy, the regulations and the technology. So all three coming together. And I think Internet has changed the way we do business today. So all of that converged. And on top of the identity layer, what became very important was one, it gave you a humongous ability to be able to give people an inclusivity into formal finance, finance by opening yes. bank accounts. So that was the first step. Yeah. But more important, it was the ability to transact. So payments yeah. became a very embedded layer for us. And as we are, as we started talking about this through payments, I think the embedding of payments into the India stack became the next big thing which allowed yes. people to transact, to interact with one another and be able to move money from point to point. I think these yes. were the two fundamental layers of identity and payments, which really yes. brought India stack to the point it is. But fundamental principles remain the same. Uh, the first came your trust layer where everybody was able to identify themselves. They yes. could be verified and that helped us to get billions of Indians into the ecosystem. Uh, you won't believe it that there was a 700% increase of bank accounts between 2010 and 2019. Yeah. 
and yeah, uh, there, there was a study done which actually talked about the fact that what india achieved in a matter of 10 years would have otherwise yes. taken 46 years as a cycle to achieve in terms of financial inclusion yeah, so definitely. i think the fundamental principles became very important uh, so on top of the payments layer if we may see it that is where the ability to discover and connect various institutions came into play today yeah. when we look at the structure of upi on which our retail payments are today running there is an interesting convergence of both the banks we have 282 banks today which are connected through the upi interface and yep. we have at the same time we've got big tech playing over there we yeah, are exactly. able to produce consumer facing uh, applications where people can actually go there they can discover they can transfer money and that that i think the convergence of big tech the bank banks everything put together in an open architecture is what yeah. drove the adoption and and where we are today yeah it's, yeah you're right and, and interestingly you 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 mentioned the entry of the the big techs um if, if you abstract back from what uh, the india stack has done you've you've made it easy uh you've it, it's almost become com payments you could argue will if they're not already they will become commoditized and so the ability to move money between accounts between organizations a very low cost all underpinned with identified uh, I, you know id underpinning that that ability to do that it sort of opens the door to non financial institutions coming in and you know we've we've seen facebook you know i, I know in india you've got google pay is huge you've got WhatsApp pay. And so suddenly the landscape has a few big dinosaurs moving in the landscape who would not traditionally be in the financial services space. And so there's, there's a couple of in Bangladesh, certainly we see a lot of business going on along around Facebook groups. And if you can layer in payments at the same time, then suddenly there's, um, it may be harder for the more traditional financial service players to to sort of stay relevant uh, and, and compete with some of the social platforms that are getting into payments. And yeah, do you, do you see that happening in, in the Indian context as well? Yeah, very much. And uh, Nick, I was actually remembering a term when you talked about payments getting commoditized. Somebody talked about ambivalent payments. So payment is an embedded layer in which whatever you're yeah. doing today, payments becomes a part of it. And you're not even thinking twice when you are enabling a payment. It is so deeply embedded into the entire yes. framework. And you're absolutely right. We do see uh, the social uh, <clears throat> the social media itself and the technology companies and the fintechs playing a very strong role in extending this entire payments layer. Because today in our daily lives, we are we are so connected using the social media platforms, using big tech. If you yes. can, in an ambivalent way, uh, embed payments into the entire layer that has played out very well and that is where mm -hmm. i think partly also drives the success of some of the platforms like upi where yeah. you have easily the ability you're bringing all the bank accounts so you're not leaving out the traditional banking wherever yes. you had your store of money a formal bank account with a banking institution but your ability to move money from point to point is yeah. what has got enabled using Great. using a structure like this so I think yeah. it's going to be a very embedded part of the development journey of payments going forward. Yeah, uh, that that phrase embedded finance, you're hearing it more and more now, and I, and I think you're you're absolutely right. It's about taking that that payments capability and putting it down into different value chains. And um, if I can be, um, if you don't mind me uh, humoring me with a couple of minutes, I wanted to share some research that we've been doing through the Wheeler Institute, London Business School, um, in Africa, because. There's a if, if, unless you've been living on uh, Mars, you know you'll you'll have seen all, vast amounts of investment capital going into some of the so-called fintechs, uh, and especially in a in a emerging economy perspective, and, and in sub-Saharan Africa, we were we're particularly interested in this at the Wheeler Institute, and we're trying to understand wh why is it going in, and what are we seeing the sort of scale impact that we would expect, given the potential that digital has, you know, the lack of of uh, formal bricks and mortar infrastructure, but the availability of 4G networks, 5G networks coming, uh, low cost smartphones, these ingredients feel like we should see scale. And so we we started an exercise with some support from the UK government, FCDO department, the ex diffid department. And they said, well, let's, let's dig a little deeper and see if we can, well, can we find 
evidence of scale and what factors drive scale. And so I'll just share, if I'm able to get the tech to work, um, I wanted to share a couple of slides that I've got uh, to, that highlight this. Maybe um, now I've lost you guys hey, on the there screen, it is. but can you see it? Yeah. Yes, it's right there. Yeah. Okay. Well, just very quickly. Um, so when, when we think about this concept of digital and scale, the, the first thing you, you have to sort of unpack is, well, what do you mean by scale? Is it is it the number of customers that, a, that an initiative has? Is it the revenue it's generating? Uh, how much money have they raised? And how many employees they have? How many deployments have they done a, a, across markets? And so we, we sort of came up with our own, everyone has their own view, of course, uh, on, on what scale means. But we, we sort of came up with an index methodology. We looked at 720 fintechs um, within uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and then we started to gather what data we could and see, well, how many of those have made it through to scale? And the, I, I'm cutting a long story short here, but but the answer was actually not as many as you might have thought. We, we see around 5% of these fintechs reaching scale using this very simple index methodology and there's different ways of course to, to measure scale but only five percent we think made it through to scale when you looked at the spread across the full 720 and then we saw a, a, a strong concentration in just three markets so nigeria south africa and, and kenya and then really just a very low sort of spattering of, of sort of scaled uh, projects elsewhere uh, and so that started, you know, then, you know, the next obvious question is, well, well, why is that? That feels quite low, given, you know, you've got a couple of standout successes that, you know, as in one, of course, but there are others. Why aren't we seeing more? And so we started digging a little deeper. And um, again, probably a lot of information on the screen. But what, what have we learned when we look at the scaled companies and compare what they've done differently to the non-scaled companies? There are a few interesting points. And this makes me this is the sort of other side to the to the coin, uh, uh, Suresh, to, to the point about the future is all digital, because I still think it's only in Africa. We have a few friction points around the interface between e-money and real money. So, so, for example, these two bars you see, you know, can you access that product through a simple feature phone? Well, the scaled ones have got feature phones as well, not just smartphones. Sure. You know, are you using sales networks and you know points at which you can go and top up your wallet? The scaled ones use agent networks, not. And so, you, if I was to sort of sum it right up, is it still a bit too early to see a pure digital play? And I th sort of think it is a little bit in Africa because you still have to deal with the real world, and cash is still king in many parts of of sub-Saharan Africa. It will come, of course. And, and, and it will come if we see more sort of top down interventions like we've seen in, in, in India. But actually, we're not quite there yet. You still have to think about operational delivery to make your businesses work at scale. And so, yeah. And so we, you know, I'll, I'll end those, those slides now. And, and but I, I'd love to get your thoughts on that, because I, I'm I, do, do you think we are um, close to the point where money gets eradicated completely. I mean, with digital, my, my, my hunch based on that research from Africa is it's probably still 10 years away. But but yeah, what, do you think we're moving closer in India? I, I would agree with you. Some of, the, some of the fundamental points make it absolutely right that it will take time. Because what, what we otherwise term at times a self-service model versus an assisted model, because even with M-Pesa, ultimately there was an agent on the ground who were assisting you yeah. in doing transactions also, because the yeah. cash in and cash out points. Uh, I, I yeah. will share with you a very interesting example of what we did with the uh, uh, India Post Payments Bank, where I was prior to joining yeah. over here at Protean. And uh, over there, some of, the, some of the technologies that we adopted so one, we, we took a very clear call that we will enable the postal network, which means the postal employees. You had uh, almost 250,000 postal employees who today provide those step services yeah. from a postal perspective. And you wanted to equip them and enable them. So we gave them a smartphone, we gave them a biometric device, and they could effectively go to the doorstep of a customer and provide them services. Now, the beauty of the thing to, to share with you is again coming back to the same thing that how do you lay out the infrastructure of your entire ecosystem 
Now in India today, we have something called as Aadhaar enabled payment services. In this case, anybody who has a Aadhaar number, which you know, as we know today that 99% of adult Indian population today has a Aadhaar or identity number. So yet yeah, that Aadhaar number is today getting embedded into your bank account. Yeah. So technically, if the if the post postman is coming to your house or the postal worker is coming to your house, you can access your account in any bank where you have an embedded Aadhaar number. So you're not yeah. looking at your accounts within India Post Payments Bank. You, you can access any account in the banking ecosystem. So mm. that created a huge network effect. As a result, what it meant was that these 190,000 postal employees were provided these uh, smartphones and biometric devices. This yeah. entire network was to reach yeah. the last mile. Now it was an assisted service, but it created a huge upside to the rural banking infrastructure, which got increased by yes. almost two and a half times. Now, if you see the fundamental building blocks, and I was, yeah. when you were talking about the presentation about how do you drive scale? Now you're talking one institution, you are not talking, I mean, you are talking a lot of people goes without saying, but yeah. the fact that this entire network became available to all institutions. So if they were only yeah. applying to India Post Payment Bank, they would have looked at the customers of India Post Payment Bank. But yeah. now you are actually serving the entire community of people who have a bank account. Yeah. So your ability to scale up gets multiplied. So I think a lot depends on the open architectures. Again, we come to the same point on the fundamental yeah. building blocks, how you stack them up. some uh, point away from saying everything will be 100% digital. Yeah. There will be assisted services, there will be the haves and the have nots, but yeah. it will be important to ensure that we create an inclusive architecture and technology which takes everybody forward. Yeah. No, you're, it's, a, it's a good point. And, you know, mobile money, um, I, I'm still surprised how many mobile money schemes forget that they've actually got it. They can have a beautiful platform you can host it in the cloud and you can run it on the best smartphones and it'll you know it'll, it'll look great but unless you've thought about those interfaces you know how do you move from that one platform into others so through apis through interoperability through standards you know it's it's sort of self constraining unless you're thinking like that from the outset and um you know i i want to talk a little bit more about these agents because what one of the embedded finance opportunities i can see ahead is is around building much more tailored credit services for those informal retailers, many of whom are, are agents of cash in, cash out. They're the mom and pop shops in, in Africa. We call them dukas, and uh, you know they they exist all over the, the world. And these are tiny little businesses, but they're equipped with a POS, typically just in the form of a, a good smartphone, and they're able to help do transactions. Now, I, I think if we Again, it's easy to look backwards, isn't it? And say, okay, we've built services for consumers. Now let's start looking at particular verticals where we can define a particular set of financial services that appeal to different groups and different segments. And, and for me, those micro retailers, that feels like a really exciting opportunity. Let's think about what can we do to drive mobile led commerce and financed commerce through those tiny little sort of vast network of distributed relay retailers. And, and um, so we're doing some work on that in, in Africa with, uh, with uh, Unilever as a partner. And, you know, I, I can see it's ripe for change. I, th I think that informal retail space, it's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, and yet we haven't seen many attempts to bring targeted financial services into that group. And that for me, that's one another example of an embedded finance solution that we can start to tailor because we've got the building blocks now that we haven't. Or, or do, do, do you see opportunities? I know or maybe perhaps it's a chance to talk about your new role at, at, at Protein. And I know you've always had this interest in the education sector and what can what can we do with digital technology in, in that particular vertical? So Nick, before coming there, I'd like to actually ask you a question because when you were alluding to the agents, the entire uh, mom and pop sector, you're actually talking at the entire MSME industry. 
Now, in yeah. India today, when we look at it, one of the big challenges facing us at this MSME industry today is the is the growth engine for the country because almost thirty percent of your GDP is driven from this sector. Only eleven percent of MSMEs today have access to formal credit. Now, yeah. one of the things which is picking up is to say that how do we work on flow based lending? Yeah. As versus you know when you talked about financing. flow yeah. based lending versus balance sheet lending because yeah. in these cases now digital history is getting created you are working on models like mpesa and all and i know yes. that africa took a very early lead and there were a lot of uh, amazing best practices on the ground so i would like to hear your comments to say how has that yeah. evolved and where do you see it going well it's a really good point and you'll you'll have heard of mshuare which was a a product that was launched on to the mpesa platform where you're building profiles of individual consumers using that transaction data and so you're shaping the the products very very nicely into needs you can you can risk adjust etc but i really this this and again maybe for the um perhaps worth a, a definition for people new to this space but flow based lending so basically you're you are actually b- building financial services that that are linked directly to the transactions that are that are going on on the on the platform and you know we we've, we've got open banking certainly here in the UK and Europe is quite well established now and it means that anybody if i if i allow them to anybody can see my transaction records and on the back of that offer me a a, a product which is you know might appeal to me and so i i think that all that all sort of comes to 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 re- reality and possibility because of that data now exists it can be accessed securely and and it becomes a, a a sort of a key ingredient in being able to come up with these more sophisticated financial services so i i, I co- after leaving mpesa i co-founded a business called m copa copa swahili for borrow and we were selling customers distributed clean energy solutions so it was a standalone solar power pack that could power a house a tv a fridge but but we financed it by connecting the equipment and then allowing the customer to, to make small payments to us so we were basically we were asset financing clean equipment and instead of spending money on kerosene and charcoal the customers would pay us digitally and we would allow the equipment to work and that was a we thought yeah we're going to the 600 million people in africa don't have access to grid power this is a big opportunity but it's actually a really hard business to make stand on its own two feet and where the way the business model evolved was to then say actually we can make this work but we have to constantly stay in relevant by offering different financial services off that first secured asset the first connected product and then you can refinance so if a good customer is paying well we can say okay you now you can now uh, apply for additional credit we'll send cash back to your mpesa account or we'll give you a loan for your small business but we secure it against the first product that we finance for them and so you become you effectively become an, there's one asset in the mix but you become a financial services provider and so we we have many debates in the early days are we an energy company or are we a financial <laughs> service provider but for me that's a that's a false barrier right? i mean finance is an enabler and we can solve energy solutions by using digital finance smartly and so that for me was um was a really uh interesting lesson and and now the business model is all it and copa has become you know we now more than a million customers and where where we're financing many different types of assets including smartphones you know by the way and in fact the smartphone business is is go- really going very strong so but yeah flow based lending that that's coming isn't it and it and you're going to start to see innovation uh, in that space and do, do you have early examples appearing in in the india context so we've some very interesting uh, i would say even interesting uh, regulatory enablers coming into play uh, rbi uh last year introduced uh, account aggregator as a as an entity uh, which basically becomes the becomes the central entity for uh creating the consent framework for sharing data so even for an individual if you want to share your data from what we are terming as financial information provider institutions to financial information user institutions so if i am wanting to take a loan from bank a and i am actually yeah. banking with bank b i can share my data through the account aggregator with with the lending institution yeah. and this entire consent architecture is what is what is being driven by the account aggregator institution uh, so the thinking over here is uh, you know not just 
ensuring that your data security and privacy privacy is maintained it is yeah. also looking at empowering you to use your own data i think that yeah. is the most important part and that yes. is what i think mpesa enabled years ago for people who are using mpesa using their payment history they can actually get you know credit yeah now, that is something which now we are evolving and you know even putting an entire framework of regulation around it uh, we've again created open architectures it is called open credit enabled uh, network where you yes. are actually using various entities whom we are terming terming as loan service providers uh, this could be as simple as a as a shopping aggregator so yeah. if you are buying goods from there you know that all the merchants who are selling through that aggregator you have their payment history with you they can yeah. affect use that same information to provide them lending capability yeah. so there are amazing examples in terms of democratizing credit especially in the msme sector but driven with a very strong regulatory framework which is binding the entire thing together yeah. so that's an interesting development over here yeah. and we are looking forward to building on that yeah, it really is. And, you know, to some of the students who might be listening who are keen to move into the digital space, do, do you see that new, those new lending models, do you sense the appetite exists in the, the, the incumbents, you know, so the traditional banks and the financial institutions, or, or do you see this as a space where new entrants are going to come in uh, and, and, and take up those models? Because, uh, you know, again, if I look, you know, back into the 720 fintechs we've seen, we, we analysed, you know, there's a there's a little bit of a, a sort of you know if you're big enough to survive. Working very very hard to sort of put get get a toehold in the market, but it's hard. You know, it's really hard. Um, so yeah, do you, do you think it's a space for for new innovation, new, new startups to to sort of move into those that specialized lending? No, absolutely, I agree with you because over here again. The risk appetite would be different because a lot of the traditional banks, if you may look at it, uh, the way we were distributing credit, credit, you are now looking at a community where you can virtually be talking about sashitizing of the credit. Yeah. Your ticket sizes are different. Your, yeah. your uh, duration of the lending is different. You are yeah. maybe even talking about lending in the morning and paying back in the evening. Yeah, now, exactly. If I look at a traditional bank, that is never the ticket size and, and, yeah. uh, and the term that you are used to. So a lot of new uh, new age digital lending institutions are coming into play. The cost of distribution, di distributing credit is going down by adopting yes. digital means yep. and uh, their risk appetite is very different. So we definitely see a whole set of new player players and entrants coming into it, uh, which could be in the form of NBFCs, which could be in the form of other lending institutions, which will yep. have a clear role to play in this case. Yeah. I've got to, I feel like we can't have this discussion without talking about cryptos, uh, Suresh, very quickly. And um, I know there's a lot of, um, uh, I think, again, personal view, um, s some of the chats you see and the hype around the cryptos and the f fintechs that are trying to build uh, sustainable models of cr cryptos. It feels, that almost feels it's still too too early. NFTs, and I, I think that's, you know, non-fungible tokens and the, the ability to, tokenize value uh, and allow exchanges to happen that feels closer to home have you are you are you sensing how, how do you see all the the sort of uh the crypto debate playing out in in india and uh, you know we can see some central banks starting to sort of seriously t look at um government backed uh, cryptos and that changes the landscape again but yeah again your insights and your look forward into india on that side would would be good for the audience to hear I think it's an interesting play between talking about pure play crypto and talking about a central bank digital currency, because that is the other thing which is being talked about in a lot of geographies, not yeah. just India, but elsewhere yes. also. So I think there is a play for that definitely going forward. And I will link it back to what you had earlier asked. And we naturally went into the flow based lending as a very interesting area in which we both worked during the MPESA days. Uh, but you had earlier spoken about other areas, you know, clearly as we look at open protocols, open networks, data sharing in an open uh, ecosystem, you can actually see applications happening in multiple sectors, mm. uh, whether you see health, whether you see agriculture, you see education. And I remember you had a question on education earlier. Yeah. So even today we are seeing that your ability to enable the finance layer within education. Yeah. Today, for example, if you want to give an education loan, 
you want to give a loan for a specific purpose. Yeah. So today in India, we also have a, we, we have a e rupee created where you can do targeted uh, delivery of benefits for a particular purpose. So I can actually give you an e rupee currency to only ensure that you use that rupee for the purpose of uh, uh, getting education. Yeah. You know, right. or getting a skill. So th yeah. these are areas in which we see a lot of uh, applications coming. Now, this could be equivalent of, uh, for example, it's more like a central bank digital currency. Yes. Exactly. Ultimately, fundamental to that is the is the is the monetary layer. But on top of that, you digitize the currency and you made it purpose uh, purposed for a particular aspect. Yeah. So I think these things are going to play a big role as yeah. we look forward. Uh, yeah. And it will be a very important and independent way in which the currency uh, sector will expand beyond what we are doing today. Because from mobile wallets to NFTs to cryptocurrencies, I think it, it's really yeah. a full scale that we are seeing over here. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and, and you're right. You, we're doing a little work in my new company for our digital. We, where you're, tr we're trying to link a, a small payment, a micro payment. Uh, we're linking it as to, to a some clear, demonstrable, auditable activity relating to carbon reduction. So, if I can prove that a certain amount of carbon reduction has happened, either through reforestation or through uh, locking up uh, organic carbon in soil. I've got some data to show that's happened, then I can trigger a small incentive payment. And, and as we look around the world and we look at which communities are going to be impacted most by, by climate change, then it tends to be the, these you know, emerging economies, again, lower in income populations. And so which we, we think we can start to build digital tools that allow these incentive payments to happen for certain climate mitigation tasks happening on the ground. And so for me, it's just because we can now move a small amount of money around in a very auditable, trustable way. Suddenly, we can start thinking about these extensions of these. You know, emb embedded finance is, is a good phrase. We can really think about these these new business models. So yeah, I'm excited. It sounds like you are too in terms of the forward look. Uh, you know, and I might you know, my hats off to to what you're doing now in your new job, and how it, India has created this framework now, which which um, I think is is being copied basically in in many parts of the world, and and I you know I I think if if we look at that pace of change since you and I were sweating out those original business models to to where we are today, and then we cast forward again, I, you know it, it feels like a, a still a very exciting exciting space. Um, so I think we're probably getting close to the end of our um, allotted period of time, and I, I think I've been prompted to. Uh, requests for the graphic to be shared. I think somebody has been sketching again in the background. I wonder if um, we could share that graphic now if it's ready. Oh, great. Here we go. Make me lo we lost you in between. Sorry. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think we now have a graphic to yes. share, which sums up our um, our conversation. So I'll I'll just take a I'll put it on full screen and <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> I, I always, I'm always amazed at how quickly whoever's doing this uh, manages to capture it's some of the things we're talking about. So, I would yeah, like an NFT, NFT of this, yeah. right? <laughs> Maybe we turn it into an NFT and sell it on the NFT market. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> well, look, Suresh, again, my my, my thanks. I know you you're a very busy man in a very important job uh, now, and it's really a pleasure to. To share thoughts. Yeah, no, uh, thank and, you to you, Nick, and it was yeah. pleasure to hear you again, to connect with you again, and I think it was a delightful conversation. Uh, time just flew, yeah. so really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, so Ash, let's stay in touch. And um, I think I now have to hand back to Navi um, as our host. And uh, great, I think that should happen now on the platform. But thank you again. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks. Yes, and I'm back. And it's been another great session that we all were able to listen to. And uh, uh, Santosh Nair must be delighted if one of his images can become an NFT of sorts. That must bring you some smile, Santosh. Uh, anyway, we are now at the last mile of this stupendous event. 
this event has been a brilliant co-creation of a number of people, some who we saw on stage, some who commented, conversations that happened, some who helped put it all together. And as we get to the last mile, I think it's important for us to reflect on all that's happened so that we kind of pick all the important necessary pieces and walk away far more richer than we came in with. So for this, we wanted to bring to you a set of tools to help jog your memory and for all of us to kind of vicariously relive all that's happened in the past three weeks. And as I had a chance to look at some of those images, my I was filled with nostalgia. Uh, it seemed as though it happened yesterday, yet three weeks have gone by. And as we jog our memories, just looking at some of this that you're going to be seeing on stage, I'm also going to be inviting you to ponder over and put into the chat box three simple questions, answers to three simple questions. The first one is, describe in one word, this is question number one, describe in one word what Beacon 2022 means to you. One word. I, I mean, I usually say one word and people take too many, but just one word. The second, What's the most memorable moment for you in this Ideas Festival and why? That's question number two. And question number three, what would you like us to do different next year? So three questions. And whenever you answer these questions, just tag the appropriate number to those questions so that we know what you're answering to. Question number one, what describe in one word what Beacon 2022 means for you. Question number two, what was the most memorable moment at the festival and why? And three, what would you like us to do differently next year? Okay, with that, we're going to jog your memory a little bit um, and just help you just remember several of the, recall several of the, uh, some excerpts from the previous weeks just for us to jog our memories and for us to recall what all happened in the last three weeks. It's going to be a short video that's coming up. And after that, we're going to, I'll come back and we'll have another video which will tell you something more. Over to you and just enjoy. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's how connected we all are. Uh, you know that you can't you can't keep yourself safe in your house um, if the staff who work there live in slums. Um, so do something about the slums they live in, right? And make sure that they don't live in slums, right? So I mean, these are things that we should see as requirements for us to engage with and recognize that we will all be taken care of when we take care of everyone around us but the way in which we have run business typically you know in a traditional mindset with the profit maximization shareholder value being the uh, dominant paradigm has actually caused a lot of inadvertent suffering i would say we talked about employee engagement being low that's its own kind of suffering but beyond that the levels of stress and burnout are epidemic and have were even before the pandemic so I have to say business uh, doesn't have to be a source of stress and suffering although it normally is for most people, that when you do it right, it actually can be a, a, a source of healing. It can be a place of healing for those who work there. You can leave physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually in a better place than when you came in in the morning. Everybody says people are our most important asset. Uh, and this pandemic challenged that and asked us to demonstrate that. Yes. And whether we really care for people, how do we take care of them? How do we give them flexibility? How do we give them support? But at the, at the, at the highest level, leadership and leaders, they have to be good human beings first. People are seeking to buy brands, work for companies, which, which stand for more than just uh, uh, the act of making money and a pure mercenary objective. And this has been true even before the pandemic. We've seen it across the world especially the younger generation, is interested in knowing what the company stands for. But ever since Unilever 
called out its purpose more explicitly we've been positively surprised at uh, what it has done to our attractiveness to talent the support teams first of all the absenteeism went down like anything but what surprised me hugely was that the turnaround time for problems really shrunk meaning that people were jumping onto the problem as soon as it was appearing on the screen even if they were not on that shift as a result of that within the first 3 4 months we started seeing the burnout and then we started actually counseling the people that stop for heaven's sake you are not on duty at this point of time it may be showing up on the screen but there is a shift that is there that is looking into it allow them to do it very difficult to do it by the way even if personally you're spending a very serious chunk of your time listening to consumers mm-hmm. or uh, pushing for consumer labs and then attending all the consumer labs and then being really interested in what is coming out of each one uh, and then you know distilling that and saying hey maybe this is what you know we should be connecting the dots this is what it means but you know getting anyone in the consumer business knows getting feedback is a privilege in education you know education traditionally has been very very resistant to changes you know so you always had situations where people complain that you know still classrooms are taught in the way the gurukuls were done or the greeks taught in you know, amphitheaters and so on and technology really was not used very widely and the business models did not really change education in a long time now with the pandemic things have changed of course and they're forced to change and it's a good time right now to rethink what education and learning will look like in the future and when i took over i knew that this is going to be an humongous exercise uh, i uh, so i'm a btech in electrical engineering but my hobby is to read history i read history a lot and uh, i realized that how systems are important and when i took over the first thing i told my team look this is going to be a long long war this is not going to end in a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of days definitely and wars are never fought by individuals wars are always fought by systems uh, like all people in all walks of life chess players can have um, will have narratives they love stories of what happened to them and so on and in most cases um your story is what you re- want to re- remember it to be but in chess we have a convention this was much stronger in the old days because the person across you was the only other person who had sat for four or five hours playing that game with you and uh, so there was a convention that you analyze the game with your opponent after it finished mm. this is healthy because first of all it teaches you to despite your frustration and everything it teaches you to sort of Uh, get a grip on yourself and try to learn what happened but the more important thing is you try to learn what happened in that game for good or bad um when it's still fresh what you actually did because by the time you go back home you think this is what must have happened to me because that's what you know the memory is fresh you're already generating explanations by the next morning you remember what you want to remember and a week later there are almost no lessons uh, worth really worth learning uh, because you have invented a story of how, how it went the fear of failing should be the last thing that you should have eh? who is successful tell me one person who's got all his films as super hits or one hero whose all films are blockbusters including rajini uh tell me one lyricist whose all the songs that he's written is a super duper yeah. hit or a music it's not possible It's not possible. So just be happy, and if you're getting success, uh, well and good. But you have got to try various things, and uh, and and you know, go into uh, you know, untreaded path. We are a country of opportunity now, as opposed to say 40 years ago, where we were stuck in that socialist, license raj kind of mindset. If you are sitting only in Bangalore or NCR and only thinking about those problems. i would say there is a much bigger india out there and there is still smaller towns and like i was in gwalior that's a smaller city right and i was in 
Pollachi. Pollachi is there, Coimbatore. And all these places really have even more abundant opportunity for striking out on your own. I wish it was last week all over again, or the week before, or the week even before that. Anyway, these are comments that we heard from the stage. What about people who consumed these comments? We've had people who just did not passively sit back on a Saturday evening and just consume stuff. They actively co-created meaning. And those are people whose views we must listen to. Some of them, not all of them, some of them. And here are another set of reflections from people who have consumed the content by actively pursuing the content, going back to where I meet, playing them many times over, distilling the essence of what was said. We ought to learn from them as well. But first, here are their comments. Let's watch the next video. So one uh, memorable moment that I took away from these uh, sessions is uh, Sridhar Bembu's story of his uh, visits to his village temple. It resonated with me well because I come from a similar village in Tamil Nadu. I've seen these big temples, marbled at them. And uh, he was talking of the same sense of wonder when he used to look at those and then thereafter uh, you know he, he was uh, asking himself why uh, civilization that produced temples like this had come down to a state where we are a poor country uh, talking of big ideas i think uh, one of the biggest things this pandemic has done which was coming through again in session after session is it has made us question uh, certain basic assumptions uh, about uh, development, about the metrics of what development means, meaning, and uh, the session by Iqbal Chahal was an eye-opener to how leadership ultimately can win over uh, all the shortages that you have in resources. And one of these sessions that uh, is very memorable for me is uh, Vishwanath Adan. And it was memorable for two reasons. Uh, one is that my own personal memory from about four decades ago was that I had seen this little boy, maybe seven or eight years old, walking down the corridor at the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. And he was the brother, younger brother, or Thambi, to one of my friends in the same cohort, his older sister. The second reason that it made the session memorable uh, was anything that you achieve in life requires a lot of hard learning. And he did that uh, with his mother, who was a good chess player, uh, as he grew up. And during those formative years, uh, his mother was a big influence. And I can relate to that with my own mother, who was a school teacher for more than 25 years. And I think the big idea that came through just listening to the experiences of uh, both Vishwanath Anand and Iqbal Chahal was 
uh, how much they both value humility which is what enables continuous learning uh, as you move through life uh, the one and with the straighter webu was something i really enjoyed and a lot of it uh, resonated with me in general uh, you know when someone who has done things themselves speak there is an authenticity and in the case of sridhar how he described what he would consider to be the characteristics of an indian mnc how he decides where to hire whom to hire how he looks to add value to the lives of the people around him apart from the product constantly evolving and you know therefore uh, continuing to play its role the uh, courage to be different and not to really seek the limelight uh, conscious it's a close to self actualization kind of uh, uh, scenario uh, which i felt i was experiencing as a teacher of the whole uh, program i really loved uh, you know the, the santosh nair intervention it sort of gives you such a lovely peg to hang your entire understanding of the session so, or recalling it in that form will actually make uh, the whole process of recall so much more uh, interesting and uh, he has added his own little humor to it it was a very very nice uh, memorable touch but there was one session that that really stood out and that was a session by the bmc commissioner uh, mr tikpal chahal there are two important things there that resonated with me uh, basically uh, mr chahal ran the the entire mission like a startup he absolutely ran it like a startup and two things that he said there resonated with what i am saying one the first one is basically he talked about how it's important to take risks and if you don't take risks uh, you know you will never move forward and the example he gave of remdesivir which he uh, finally uh, bought at a much higher price than what the government had done and that was subject to so much so much risk but he still stood by what he believed in went ahead and 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 basically did what he had to and after that it just became a benchmark for the rest of the country and the second thing um, you know that uh, that he said which is so uh, so valid and important is that it's basically systems that run such programs systems that run war rooms like this and not necessarily just people and he was talking about how systems run the army and this is the other thing that i believe uh, you know that that startups successful startups always have so this is typically how a startup is run and it's run basically when your ability to take risks is high calculated risks is high and second is you run it through systems processes and technology and and hence people become more successful what i found interesting with all these people is the depth at which ideas are processed now ideas can be processed at many levels you can just bob about on the surface or you can go deeper or you can go even deeper and when you go deeper there's stillness at the same time you get the riches of the ideas for one more deeper level processing of takeaways from this conversation i'm going to invite the dean professor banerji on stage who will lead the processing at another level at a greater depth over to you professor banerji uh, thank you so much kavi and uh, what we'd also like to do is we'd like to invite a couple of our very active participants and uh, i am requesting satish uh, satish who's been a former leader with the tata group and i'm requesting ms ganga who's been a deputy cag uh they have been very active through the festival and i'd like to just invite them and share their thoughts and their feedback and then i'll also you know i've been looking at the audience thoughts and comments and talk about that uh so satish and uh, ganga if i can just start with my first question if you which have resonated with you satish maybe i can go to you first and then come to ganga thank you uh, first of all it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be uh, 
part of the wrap up uh, so thank you uh, uh, kavi and and uh, ranjan uh, to me this has been the entire uh, beacon experience has been uh, just short of drinking from a hose pipe drinking from a hose pipe can overwhelm you and and you know lock you up uh, but this has been high intensity and and uh, really thought provoking uh, stuff which has come through and been very very uh, enjoyable for me a uh, couple of things that are threads of thought that got triggered i'd like to quickly touch on i think the one one session that started it all was the uh, ajit ranade shiv kumar noshad forbes uh, entitled reimagining the economy and to me as i heard what was said and what was what was being discussed uh, it sounded more like reimagining society of course economy is a part of it but the perspective of all three of them uh, two of whom i know personally was amazing uh, instances noshad's uh, uh, point about focusing on those who were left behind rather than just you know a, a concept called equality and and uh, driving towards that as an abstraction uh, shiv's notion of what i in my words was selfish selflessness what an amazing way he put it together that it came through to me that the ultimate form of being selfish is to be completely selfless as was in the case of the example cited of uh, noshad statement of uh, if if there are people serving us who are living in slums then make sure they don't live in slums uh, rather than try and protect yourself with a mask or with a restrictive uh, bans etc the third thing was i think at a very practical level the notion of a digital divide actually coming through clearly in its unpacking uh, as an access divide access to healthcare access to so not just digital it is a whole social phenomena that permeates every aspect of life which was brought home to us in the pandemic and heightened uh, and the final point over there was this notion of let's create an employable population so that's one piece quickly second piece nitin paranjpe was another high point uh, i was really i'm still unpacking that of when there is no playbook of the un unimaginable reality uh, you have to fall back on basic values simple statement very clear but reads a lot of unpacking to say heck so what does this really mean in the battle that's going on in the street or will be there in the streets tomorrow uh and his calm thoughtful presence uh i i look at that and now reflect uh connecting recent events at, at unilever maybe which is unfair but it's the dots i i connected to uh this is amazing leadership it must have been that he was speaking in the middle in the throes of turbulence ambiguity unknowns choices which were you know heart wrenching dilemmas uh and yet crafting a thoughtful way forward in his presence with us uh the calmness and the mindful concern for the things that really were valuable what really mattered came through as a stunning example of leadership it it was just living making it come alive for me thank you uh, thank just you. a final one before i run off mm -hmm. uh the crucible of experience makes for depth and detail to be more memorable dimension of chahal's uh, uh, leadership master class yes and i'm repeating something that was said but with a different take uh he talked about a war which had two elements that came through urgency and stamina uh systems which unify the approach which he put into place across all the 40 odd wards uh and therefore there is structure which is uniform an empowerment of the wards which enabled people to feel the freedom to act 
So the concept of success in freedom within a framework and battle being urgency, heart, and stamina. Sorry, I, that, that was a kind of no, no, thank hot you very linkages much. that I went through. Thank you very much. That is very comprehensive. And Ms. Ganga, would you like to add something? I mean, there, there have been a lot of dimensions you've been covered. Something to build upon there for you. Yeah. So uh, the thing which I found most, uh, uh, like something which hit me a lot after see, listening to most of the sessions is the fact that the central theme for everybody's talk or discussion was that people are the most important thing in everything. I mean, so you almost everybody spoke about the need to show more humanism, the need to be concerned about uh, the people who are left out, the need to bridge the gaps and the need to include people. So somewhere or the other, it was always that. and. And that it would automatically lead to maybe profit or success or final achievement of the goal. So people have to be to this in the center. I think that was a common theme running through all the talks. And of course, in terms of uh, the sessions which that I liked, I I did. Uh, I can see that everybody, lots of people have said that they liked Iqbal Chahel's uh, session a lot. And uh, I'm guilty too. I also think that uh, his session was one of the most power packed uh, sessions. And it's not because of any bias that I'm a fellow bureaucrat or anything, but it's just that it was like as if he condensed several management textbooks together in one 15 minute power packed session full of emotion. He spoke about so many things. He spoke about the need for systems, the need for decentralization, the need for uh, involvement and participation of everybody, the need for creating war rooms or to coordinate everything and monitor everything, the need for, you know, using dashboards and technology and data, the need for, uh, and how he actually did it. it was not just talked about the need, but how it actually got implemented on the ground. And finally, what really struck me in his thing was the the way he expressed how about the humility of uh, that needs to be shown in all this, and to use everybody in the system to reach out to every single person. So amongst the other sessions, also I found those sessions where the the so-called customer base or the client base is literally everybody. So like, for instance, for Iqbal Chahel, it was the entire resident population of Mumbai. It was not those who travel, you know, buying tickets on Make My Trip. Why? I mean, of course, each one has uh, is concerned about their own segment. But the ones like so when even uh, today's session, when uh, Ria uh, spoke about the uh, the disposable packaging which she has come out. It's about everybody. It's like not identifying individual A, B, C or Vembu. I mean like Sridhar Vembu's again was about, you know, going back to the rural places. I mean to staying connected but yet being rooted to your uh, this thing. So I think that was really very uh, important and finally what as a reflection for me is that most of the people who spoke and most of the people's leadership qualities came out in this whole pandemic crisis my what i'm thinking and what i'm now trying to uh, put up in my head run it through my head is how do you ensure that such kind of leadership qualities are shown when business is as normal, mm. not in a crisis situation. And I think that for that, there are some other speakers who actually had already become what Venbu, for instance, Sridhar Venbu has done or what Ria did. They are people or uh, Mehta did. They have been doing all this, reaching out to the people even before the pandemic. So maybe we have to take lessons from there. Combine it with the lessons from those who have managed well in a crisis and then figure out how to make sure that we do it all the time, not only when crisis hits us. Thank you so much, both of you. I think you've done such a great job of summarizing so much of the content of the festival. 
we have to move this quickly to a wrap up so i am not going to add much to this except to say two or three themes that came across one is reimagining business cannot be done without reimagining society the two go hand in hand you have to, we talk about esg uh, environment sustainability uh, but along with esg perhaps what this pan, what this entire beacon has raised is ehg empathy humility and gratitude uh i am going to talk about two more things quickly one of the things i take away is that you know we had three speakers who were not from a conventional business perspective a vishwanath anand a shankar mahadevan and an iqbal chahal and they did as much to illuminate the way we think about business and management as any other speaker and i think one of the things we take away is we must have different voices on this table and finally one thing that has set this whole beacon apart is the voice of the youth the voice of our students and to talk a little bit about something exciting that our students have been doing i am going to invite dr leena chatterjee to talk about some student projects at the intersection of society and business so dr leena chatterjee uh, thank you ranjan so um, you know i am pleased to share three innovative ideas for change that have been developed by our students and that we are proud to showcase as part of our ideas festival so let me give you a little bit of a background to this as you have seen students have been partnering with us in organizing the festival in various roles and one such group of ayushi anisha and krithik were tasked with brainstorming on how to get students to contribute to the theme of the festival and they came up with this interesting idea of having a competition among groups of students to address complex problems in the public domain to research and look for insights and to propose a solution um they also identified five broad areas that you know students could uh, use as themes for kind of their project now initially we had about 13 teams participating uh, in the you know uh, competition and over a period of time this was reduced to five after screening and uh, these five groups pitched their idea to uh, some of us and then finally three of the ideas were chosen to be shake showcased in today's session so um i think you know the interesting thing was that we gave these three teams twin a hard deadline of 20 days within which they had to flesh out that idea improve it they had to do much more deeper insight into the issue and the problems to find the sweet spot of where they could make a difference and to come up with some kind of a rapid prototype or pilot test for their uh, solution now that was quite a hard call for them and you know we had a ringside seat on to looking at this very interesting thriller that was playing out in front of us where there was lots of twists and turns and challenges and um, you know we came up with actually a photo finish this morning so it has been exciting and i think that it was a very uh, it was very gratifying to see how the students were willing to kind of uh, keep going back to the drawing board go and look out for more insights from primary primary sources from secondary sources to look at and go through various iterations of their prototypes and then finally to learn how to make a video and to do some storytelling to present their idea so i think they had a real steep le learning curve and i think you know we are quite proud of their uh, you know final products yes it is a work in progress but i think in the time that they were given they really uh, delivered i think that what i would also like to say is that uh, while they worked i you know i think that they also showcased some other things that i think we are proud to kind of talk about and that is a very strong learning mindset a very positive attitude and openness to feedback a lot of grit and determination to you know forge ahead and a kind of never say die attitude right up to the end and it gives me great pleasure to show you a small trailer of the three 
projects. Uh, there are three projects. The first one is on how to encourage and, and facilitate volunteering among the youth for social causes. The second one is actually interestingly in the area of waste management and around the issue of helping societies to segregate waste and to um, deliver it to uh, the uh, end uh, users of that so that it can be you know, well managed. And the third project is around how do we help organizations, especially smaller organizations, to uh, get back to what we call hybrid work. So how do we create systems through which we can help them to take these decisions? So um, I'm going to you know, uh, uh, ask somebody to quickly put on the video. These are a kind of a trailer. This is Raj. Raj is someone who wishes to give back and has tried to volunteer quite a few times before but he faced a number of problems like feeling unappreciated, feeling demotivated, facing conflicts with other volunteers and even facing trouble in finding good NGOs. One of the NGOs he worked for was Dan. Now Dan faced issues in attracting volunteers and it was even more difficult to retain them. Most of the volunteers they attracted were young and diverse but the tasks assigned to them were not in line with their area of expertise which further led to a wastage of time and resources. Well, we have one solution for both their problems which is Unity, an app-based platform which aims to revolutionize the social volunteering experience. To know more about Unity, visit us at our booth. It's been two years since the start of the pandemic. Advances in healthcare and digital technology have eased the unsettlement at the workplace caused by COVID-19. But what about the way people will work? Do we really imagine ourselves going back to office every morning? Employees have experienced a better quality of life with the flexibility of working from home. Hybrid working is not a one-size-fits-all model. As the companies transition employees into new hybrid environment, there lies a significant challenge in front of us. How do we organize workforce post-COVID such that expectations of all stakeholders are managed well? Introducing Rework. Rework is a software as service that assists the decision-making process for hybrid work. So you were able to see the trailer and uh, each of these groups is available with their whole video and the, their kind of rapid prototypes in the booths uh, in this air meet uh, area. And I encourage you to go and have a look at their videos, to talk to them, to give them feedback and to, um, you know, encourage them in this labor of love. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Professor Chatterjee. Uh, so, so to the Dean uh, Ranjan, uh, you've, you, you've run a long marathon and you're at the end, you're breasting the tape. How does it feel? 
So Kavi, two points. I think adjectives are important, pronouns are important. So we've run a long marathon. We've done it with you. We have been partners through this journey. It does feel good, but you should always, you know, I, I am a great believer in celebrating briefly and looking forward. And uh, to my mind, what we are trying to do, I think Beacon has the potential to be an out of India platform for global thought leadership. So we will quickly get back to the drawing board, figure out what worked and try to get much better. I've been looking at the feedback very, very carefully. So it feels good. Let's celebrate briefly. There's much more to be done. Okay. Next question. What's next? So uh, there are three things and maybe we can bring up some slides here. There are three specials uh, that we would mm -hmm. want to share. I think there is this uh, fantastic conversation that I was privileged to have with Roger Martin and Jeff Garrett. Jeff Garrett is the dean of USC Marshall. Roger Martin is one of the world's probably Thinkers 50. He's number one globally. And there's this wonderful conversation coming up on Monday evening. And, and that's something that I would encourage this entire audience to look at. Really fascinating conversation. We have something coming up on Wednesday. Next slide, please. Uh, we have Ram Charan in conversation with my good friend Shiv Shiv Kumar. And they've known each other for over 15 years. And they're talking about the leader of tomorrow. Uh, and then on Friday, and this is, of course, subject to Nandan's health, I think there is a Twitter Spaces conversation with Nandan Nilakani and Tanuj Bhojwani. We were talking about their new book. So this is just a sampler, and this is what we have for Beacon this year with these three events. But we will also, Kavi, I think, summarize a lot of the content, create small videos. We will keep the conversations going. The second is as we reach out to this audience, and this audience tells us what they would like us to talk about, we will have more content from Bitsom that will help us to engage with this community and do that over an extended year so that when Beacon comes along next year, it's not like we did something for three months and went away. We will stay in touch. Okay, so that brings me to the last question before you take it away. How else do you want to keep this community and the sense of community of so many people that have come together to pull this off? How do you intend to keep this together? and keep it going for some time? So I think the community has a power of its own. So once people do conversations and find them valuable, they may not wait for your platforms. They will continue with those conversations. But I think what we can do is we can listen well. We can ask a lot of questions and we can continually be adaptive. And over a period of time, we will earn the trust of the community that if there is a question around business and society, that you are asking today, tomorrow Bitsom will have a conversation that addresses that, that question. So if we listen well and mm. we respond well and we use the power of our extended community, then the community will help us feed itself. And I, I think that that is the potential of this relationship. So having said that, Kavi, uh, you know, there are two very pleasant tasks that I have to do. So first of all, there are a lot of people to thank. Uh, I must thank all the people who have made Beacon possible. Uh, first of all, our partners, uh, Founding Fuel, led by Indrajit Gupta. Beacon was an idea when IG and I talked in, I think, May 2021 for the first time. You have taken the idea and given it shape. And there is much that you have brought to the idea, which we could have not have done without you. So uh, I think together we have been able to create something that is so much larger. To the leadership of Bitsom, to the Chancellor, Mr. Pilla, Mr. Birla, to Mr. Bhattacharya, you saw this when this was a nascent idea and you gave us the backing. Because at that point in time, it was just the promise and that promise has been converted into some reality. To a larger network, to people like Natasha, to people like Sandeep, to, the good, to our agencies, the Good Edge, to Flying Cursor, to the wonderful marketing team led by Chetan Ganguly. Uh, the Bitsom leadership team and the Bitsom team that has worked on this, a big thank you. A lot of this would not have been possible without our speakers who gave time to be a part of this. My friend Rajesh Chandy and his team at the Wheeler Institute at London Business School who have made today possible. Uh, and last but definitely not the least, our visiting faculty, the Bits alumni who have been part of the panel. And the final two words of thank you definitely must go to Number one, the audience, over 60 CEOs have sat and attended. And they've not just attended. They've not dropped in and dropped out. They've attended all three sessions. They have commented. One of the big visions that we had in this is the community will enrich the content. It's one of these things you say and you say, I hope it happens. Well, it happened. 
uh, we, we, can, we can do much more with it, uh, but it happened. And finally, Kavi, I think the last round of appreciation must go to the Bitsom founding class. The write-ups that are going out, the discussions that are happening, the comments that are going out, the contact to the speaker, the service, yeah. they are learning management and leadership by doing it today. And with that, I would like to say on behalf of you and me and Avantika, who's not here, and everybody here at Bitsom and Founding Fuel, thank you very much for being with us. But I have one final request. We have three wonderful student projects. They will be very happy if you go to their booths, see the videos, and please ask them questions. You, in When you ask our student questions and you work with their ideas, you are helping us build the next generation of leaders. Beacon will be back. Beacon will be stronger. And we will be in touch. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a privilege. Thank you.